history, a premier and paramount priority for progress of a people, arguably the single most important cultural property. It is the great unifier of all societies, from classical to contemporary. It is the shining beacon that restores vision to the blind. It is imperative that we create a unified effort to learn from it, that we may emulate its successes and prevent repeating its mistakes. For without history, we are without purpose. We are without identity. Welcome to the gray area where we examine history in hindsight. January 6th, 1773, Massachusetts slaves petitioned the legislature for freedom. There is a record of eight freedom petitions during the Revolutionary War period. 1820, the first organized immigration to Africa begins when 86 free African Americans leave New York Harbor aboard the Mayflower of Liberia. They were bound for a British colony of Sierra Leone, which welcomed free African Americans and fugitive slaves. 1832, New England Anti-Slavery Society organized at African Baptist Church on Boston's Beacon Hill. In October of 1868, John Mercer Langston founded and organized the law department of Howard University, the first in a black school. He headed the department when classes formally began on this day, January 6th, 1869, and was its dean from 1870 to 1873. From 1873 to 1875, he was vice president and acting president of the university. 1898, the first telephone message from a submerged submarine by Simon Lake, who revolutionized the way naval communications would be conducted. It was a marvel of engineering at the time. 1912, New Mexico becomes the 47th state in the Union. Also in 1912, Alfred Wegener, geophysicist and meteorologist, presents his new controversial theory of continental drift in a lecture at the Geological Association at the Sickenberg Museum in Frankfurt, Germany. 1930, the first diesel engine automobile trip was completed. To promote the diesel engine, Cummings Engine Company owner Clessy Cummins mounted a diesel engine in a used Packard touring car and set out for the National Automobile Show in America's first diesel-powered automobile on this day in 1930. The 800-mile trip from Indianapolis to New York City used only 30 gallons of fuel, which at the time cost only a dollar and 30 cents, and a car that weighs nearly as much as a Cadillac Escalade. 1941, U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt makes his four freedom speech, freedom of speech and worship, freedom from want and fear, during his U.S. State of the Union address. 1980, the beginning of the first GPS epoch. 2005, the murderer of Mississippi civil rights workers, Edgar Ray Killen, is arrested as a suspect for the 1964 murders of three civil rights workers. This story is interesting. It took over 40 years to catch this murderer, and it made me think. I've heard the common propagandized narrative that blacks commit half the murders in the United States despite being only 13% of the population, which always makes me think. I know that nearly half of the murder cases in this country go unsolved, even according to the FBI. So without nearly half of the data, are black people really committing half of the murders with such a small population? Or has the black population remained small due to being murdered? And that that nearly half of unsolved murders figure really represents how much murder whites actually get away with in this country. I mean, it took the so-called authorities over 40 years to catch Edgar Ray 
Kylan. Either the authorities knew all along about his crimes and just turned a blind eye, or the society in its entirety simply covered for him and made excuses. Or maybe he was featured in one of these photos. Just look at these faces. You can clearly see they murdered with impunity for sheer enjoyment. Furthermore, you know there were no discriminator of age as just two years before Edgar Ray Kylan was arrested on this very day, January 6th, the mother of Emmett Till also died at the age of 81, while neither her or Emmett Till received justice for Emmett Till's savage and brutal murder. But rewinding all the way back to 1842, little known incident, and it's a quite interesting incident that has to do with war history, in which 4,500 British and Indian troops make an attempt to withdraw from Kabul, but were massacred before reaching India. You see, during the first Anglo-Afghan War in 1839, Britain, along with the East Indian Company, marched on Kabul, Afghanistan, deposed the sitting ruler, imprisoned him. His name was Amir Dost Muhammad Barakzai. After deposing him and arresting him, the British installed their proxy sock puppet Shah Shuja Durrani, whom Barakzai deposed before. However, because Barakzai did not believe in killing his own countrymen, he allowed Shah Shuja to live, though in prison. Three years later on this day, January 6th in 1842, an uprising led by the son of Barakzai, Prince Akbar Khan, forced Major General William Elphinstone, leader of the occupation, to withdraw his garrison. General Elphinstone came to what he thought was an agreement with Prince Khan to allow him to fall back around 90 miles to the British outposts Jalalabad. While withdrawing a few miles outside of Kabul, General Elphinstone and his envoy were ambushed and massacred. After the elimination of Elphinstone's convoy, Prince Akbar Khan and his army proceeded to massacre all who were complicit in the deposing of his father. He also eliminated all who were loyal to Britain or had ties to the East Indian Company, racking up a total body count to over 15,000. The annihilation left Britain and India spooked, and the Governor General, Lord Auckland, suffered an apparent stroke when he heard the news. Later that year, an army of retribution and revenge, led by George Pollock, which was more than three times the size of Elphinstone's convoy, leveled the Great Bazaar and all of the larger buildings of Kabul. However, the slaughter of a joint British and Indian army by Afghan tribesmen was humiliating for the British Empire. The British at that time had proclaimed themselves as gods above all men and that it was their divine right to rule over the uncivilized Afghan savages. And this day in 1842, Prince Akbar Khan showed Britain that even God was not beyond the reach of a tribal spear. Prince Akbar Khan died in 1847, being poisoned at the hands of his own father, whom he fought for in order to get him to return from exile. Prince Akbar's actions, however, were not in vain. Even 10 years posthumously after his death, those actions would later influence India itself to rise up against Britain and fight for India's independence. You see, history, much like time, waits for no man. It is ultimately up to us to decide whether we choose to make it or be the reason we repeat it. However, no matter what side of it that you stand on, you can only learn from it by looking at history in hindsight.